Today's sponsor is MyHeritage, the comprehensive genealogy platform perfect for building and discovering your family tree. More on them in a bit. If asked to name the most travelable city in the world, you'd be hard pressed to name a city more popular than Paris. The city of love is known worldwide as a city people love to travel to, and who can blame them? There's so much history to experience and food to enjoy in Paris that the city attracts well over 30 million visitors per year. But of all its attractions, Paris's architecture often steals the show. When you think of Paris, you think of the Palace of Versailles, the Louvre, the Arc de Triomphe, the Eiffel Tower. We could go on. The history of these attractions is not actually widely known. Many of them were built or remodeled much more recently than you might think. The 20th century brought major changes to Paris that define its skyline today. The story behind it involves political figures, some of Paris's most iconic sites, and socialism. So let's look at the grand projects of Paris. To get a better idea of the iconic buildings in Paris, let's take a trip back through history to see the developments of Paris as we know it today. As a city, Paris got its start under the Romans in 52 BC, but back then it wasn't called Paris. The only thing with a name close to that is the Parisi tribe, the Gaelic people Rome defeated to occupy that land. When Rome first established their city in the present day location of Paris, it was known as Letitia. When the Roman Empire fell, Paris almost met that same fate. In fact, several instances throughout history almost brought Paris to its knees, but more on that a little bit later. Though much of the Roman architecture was dismantled, repurposed, or destroyed during the Dark Ages, you can still witness traces of the original Roman design. Rue Saint-Jacques, a road that cuts down the heart of Paris, was the original Roman road in and out of then Letitia. Not much happened in Paris architecturally during the first half of the Common Era. It wasn't until the 1100s that the city re-emerged on the scene as a world leader. The French Gothic style, characterized by pointed arches, cross vaults, and flying buttresses, appeared in buildings across the city during this time. If you need an example of what the Gothic style looks like, well, search no further than Notre Dame de Paris. It's one of the best known examples of the style and has grown to represent Paris's preeminent role in architecture. Unfortunately, the good fortune that Notre Dame brought Paris was to be short-lived. The 1300s brought a series of catastrophes so devastating it's a miracle the city survived. Severe flooding, the church likened to the Great Flood of Moses, deluged the city. Crop failures and its now blame on a mini ice age nearly starved Parisians. The Black Death killed upwards of 800 Parisians a day, wiping out a third of the city's population before it ended. Though Paris experienced a turn in luck at the start of the Renaissance under King Francis I, the city soon descended back into chaos. After King Francis I died, Catholic and Protestant factions tore the city apart in their brutal fights. It wasn't until the Protestant King Henry VI converted to Catholicism, extended the Louvre, and built the Pont Neuf that Paris experienced peace once again. It was under the Sun King, Louis XIV, that Paris received its first major makeover. Although Louis XIV hated the city of Paris, his advisor, Jean-Baptiste Colbert, understood the importance of Paris as a symbol of power. Just as Rome represented the power of the Roman Empire, so too should Paris represent the might of the French throne. From this period came the Baroque style of architecture. Such famous examples as the Palace of Versailles and the Hôtel des Invalides came to be during this era of French classicism. It wasn't until Louis XIV's death, at the start of the Enlightenment in France, that Parisian architecture evolved again. The new era brought about the Rococo style and spurred the building of many important sites. The Hôtel Matignon and the Hôtel de Evreux, present-day homes to the Premier and President of France respectively, uh, were built then, as was the Place de la Concorde. As the French Revolution tore up the old way of doing things and invented them anew, so it happened with Paris's architecture. As Napoleon rose to power as the new French emperor, he too looked to remodel Paris as a symbol of his political power. Under his reign, Napoleon began building the Père Lachaise Cemetery, renovated parts of the Louvre again, began construction on the Madeleine Church, and dug the Orc Canal. Shortly after Napoleon was exiled for good, and after a brief stint of being a republic, France once again fell under the control of an emperor named Napoleon. This time it was Napoleon III, nephew of the original emperor. Napoleon III's reign would be rather short, but during his time on the throne, he connected with Baron Georges Eugène Haussmann, who helped him remake Paris once more. The citywide remodeling turned out to be more practical than previous ones. The apartment buildings he designed are still used as the standard for Paris. The sewage systems he installed are still in use today, and the layout of Parisian boulevards has accommodated even hectic 21st century traffic. After two world wars rocked France, no major changes happened to the skyline of Paris, save one major build. 
The Sorcerer Georges Pompidou. This building, home to a massive collection of contemporary and modern art, would also change the course of contemporary and modern architecture in Paris and throughout Europe. This is where history catches up to our story. Building on this rich history of architecture and development in Paris, the 21st president of France, Francois Mitterrand, started his grand projects. So, are you looking to explore your family's history? Do you have questions about relatives you've never met or documents like birth and death certificates that have been lost with time? Then MyHeritage is perfect for you. With over 19 billion records available and an intuitive platform, MyHeritage is the perfect tool for anybody looking to do a deep dive into their family tree. I've already made incredible discoveries about my own family. I've gone back to the mid 19th century, 1850s, to see where my mother's family came from. They originally immigrated from Germany, which was cool. I was like, oh, that's where you got the, the, the random German name. <laughs> not my name, it's my mother's name that changed. I'm not going to tell it to you because when you phone up your bank, it's what they ask for. <laughs> Look, I never knew any of this history existed. My family just never really talked about it, so it's fascinating to use my heritage to dive back and look at all of that stuff. And not only is this information easily accessible, but my heritage also provide a platform for repairing, colorizing, and enhancing even your oldest family photos. You're seeing an example of mine on the screen right now. Another great feature of MyHeritage is their AI time machine, which uses AI technology to let you see yourself as a historical figure. Again, some examples of me on the screen now. The process of creating your own family tree is simple and efficient, so don't wait any longer to start discovering new information about your past. Sign up for a 14-day free trial of all the features of MyHeritage, and if you do decide to continue after your trial period ends, use the link provided below and you'll get a 50% discount. Unlock your story with MyHeritage, and now back to today's video. You can make the argument that nothing in modern history would exist if not for the struggle between socialism and capitalism. Ever since socialist ideology was popularized in Paris with the French Revolution, it has shaped our modern world. From the Russian Revolution, World War II, the Chinese Civil War, the Cold War, the Korean War, the Vietnam Wars, and political and economic struggles still bubbling today, socialism is responsible for many of the major events of the 20th century. Now we can add the grand projects of Francois Mitterrand to that list. In a series of moves many in the United States would consider reminiscent of the whims of a monarch, Mitterrand embodied the French belief in the state as a paternal figure and remodeled large swaths of Paris. By remaking his capital city, the French president attempted to construct, as Marie Delarue, author of Un Ferredon Republicain, monuments to utopian egalitarianism. It's fitting that the socialist ideology born in France would be a driving force behind Paris as major modern makeover. But when Francois Mitterrand became the first socialist president of France in 1981, it was against loud complaints from his political rivals, supporters of his conservative political nemesis, Charles de Gaulle. As has defined many political rivalries in the world, there was an inherent competition between the leftist and conservative politics of the two men. Being the first socialist president of France, Mitterrand perhaps had something to prove. As the modern world recovered from the devastation of World War II and grew used to the new geopolitical power tug of war between the US and the USSR, Mitterrand aimed to uphold France's position on the world stage. His surprising continuation of de Gaulle's diplomatic strategies aimed at reducing US influence in French affairs won France favor in many parts of the developing world. This allowed the new president to, as some experts put it, punch above his weight class. After snatching geopolitical power from the jaws of post-colonial decline, what ruler wouldn't want to immortalize? their hard-earned power by making over a capital city. There is some debate over to what extent his socialist beliefs, his desire to cement his legacy over that of de Gaulle, or his desire to promote Paris to the ranks of premier cities each played. It is safe to say, though, that all three influenced Mitterrand's grand projects. Following the example of countless French leaders before him, Mitterrand embarked on an expensive remodeling of Paris. This project, though, would prove to rival even those of Louis XIV and both Napoleons. You might not have heard of Francois Mitterrand, but you've definitely seen his mark on Paris. By the end, the grand projects would influence, remake, or build from scratch the Louvre Pyramid, the Musée d'Orsay, the Parc de Villette, the Arab World Institute, the Opera Bastille, the Grand Arche de la Défense, the Ministry of the Economy and Finance, and a new campus for the National Library. 
As observers put it, Miserar undertook eight monumental building projects that in two decades transformed the city skyline. The most well-known entry in this modern French mega-project is the Louvre Pyramid. When Miserar took office, the Louvre, though expanded, renovated, and rebuilt many times throughout history, was a confusing tangle of hallways and offices, some functioning as a museum, others as headquarters of the Ministry of Finance. It was nowhere near what countless tourists know the Louvre to be today, one of the top art museums in the world. As the story goes, during his first visit to the U.S. as French president, Mitterrand towards the National Gallery in Washington, D.C., designed by I.M. Pei. Mitterrand was so impressed with Pei's work that he invited the architect to come to Paris and tackle the Louvre problem. Pei got to work right away. He requested that the Ministry of Finance be moved to separate grounds, placed a high-ceilinged shopping mall in the middle of the Louvre corridors, and, most controversially, proposed a large glass pyramid as the centerpiece of it all. This glass pyramid appealed so much to Mitterrand that he requested a complete mock-up to be assembled on site for his inspection. Somewhat to the confusion of the contractors, the French president micromanaged the project. He inspected the glass, metal, and other materials used in person. Many observers did not have such a positive reaction to the idea. Several decried the pyramid as an eyesore or thought it would ruin a historic part of the city. However, after it was built, critics fell silent fairly quickly. The glass pyramid quickly became, as critics now call it, the Diamond of Paris. The large central area of the pyramid sits above worked wonders in bringing all the twisting corridors of the old Louvre neatly together. This change allowed visitors to navigate the extensive art collection with much more ease. Since the Ministry of Finance was removed from the Louvre, a new building was constructed to house their offices. In 1982, a design competition marked the beginning of the new headquarters for the Finance Ministry. By the time it was finished, the Ministry's offices would migrate to a building nicknamed the Steamboat for its length. Critics also compared it to a fascist and Stalinist architecture in the mixed reviews that followed. The Arab World Institute, which sits on the Seine and houses a museum, library, auditorium, restaurant, and offices, was designed by Jean Nouvel. The building won the Aga Khan Award for Architecture and catapulted Nouvel to worldwide fame. One of its defining features, a metal screen with moving geometric patterns, is actually a clever temperature and light control system and a tribute to Islamic architecture's incorporation of climate control methods. The Opera Bastille was designed by Carlos Art, a Uruguayan Canadian. It was inaugurated in 1989 on the 200th anniversary of the storming of the Bastille. The building is the largest opera house in Paris, boasting 30 floors, 2,700 seats, and a bill of 2.8 billion francs, or about $450 million, to build. The Bibliothèque Nationale de France, the National Library, opened in 1996, was the last completed and most costly of the grand projects. Its design, intended to imitate open books, comprises four L-shaped towers, all 25 stories high, surrounding a sunken garden. The library is said to contain over 10 million books. Because of its high-rise design, the construction of the library encountered technical difficulties and considerable budget overages. Due to excessive spending, the International Conference Center, the last proposed installment of the grand projects, was scrapped. The only part of the grand projects that was not built within Paris City itself is the Chobao Cultural Center. It was built on the narrow Tino Peninsula in Noumea, the capital of New Caledonia, and is dedicated to showcasing the Kanak culture, the indigenous culture of the region. Other sites included in the grand projects, though not commissioned by François Mitterrand himself, include the Musée d'Orsay, the Parc de la Villette, and the Grand Arche de la Défense. The construction of the Musée d'Orsay started under Mitterrand's predecessor, however, it is included as part of the grand projects because the view and scope of the project changed significantly under Mitterrand's presidency. The project saw the conversion of the Gare d'Orsay, the train station, into the art museum that it is today. The Parc de la Ville project was also launched before Mitterrand's reign. The vision was to create a national park with a music center and a museum of science and technology. The park now covers an area of 55 acres and is an artistic, cultural, and popular central park in Paris. Being such a massive undertaking, parts of the park were completed in stages over more than a decade. The gardens of the park were opened in 1987, the music and dance centers opened their doors in 1990, the music and concert halls 1995, and the music museum in 2000. Finally, the Grand Arche de la Défense was built at the end of the Axe Historique, or the historical axis that runs through the center of Paris. The Axe Historique follows the course of the sun from rising to setting and includes such notable monuments as the Louvre, the Place de la Concorde, Champs-Élysées, and the Arc de Triomphe. It was built to be a 20th century version of the Arc de Triomphe dedicated to humanitarian ideals rather than military victories. For its construction, Mitterrand personally saw to it that the largest grain in Europe was brought in. When it was completed in 1989, observers noted that it formed a near-perfect cube. Some went so far as to say that it resembled a tesseract, a four-dimensional cube projected onto our three-dimensional world. 
Mitterrand marked its inauguration with grand military parades that also celebrated the 200th anniversary of the French Revolution.